Go to Ecclesiastes chapter number one. Now we read over it a little bit last week when we started out our series, and we just uh, really made some introductory thoughts. Today we're going to study over chapter number one, all 18 verses, and, and teach through it a little bit, and uh, be reminded through the teaching uh, by the Holy Spirit, by His Word, all Scripture has been given to us by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And uh, this morning we're looking at, um, again, our first full chapter teaching, but our second message on search for purpose in everything. We found that out of our theme verse in chapter number 13 that's up on the screen. And I gave my heart, Solomon says, to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. And if you stop right there, you go, that's really a worthy assignment. That's a good assignment. In fact, that's what we preached and taught about. We looked at a background of Solomon, the, the, the background of King Solomon being the last king of the United Kingdom of Israel and how after his death, things got a little crazy. They already were difficult and God's people, but then, of course, they got even more difficult. And this man, Solomon, started out really, really well. And that's kind of like a, that theme that's going to go through our study constantly is, as we think, okay, Solomon, you searched out purpose. You searched out God. You were the wisest man on the face of the earth. God met with you twice. Look in your Bible and try and find someone that was met by God like that. More than that, it's powerful to think of this man Solomon who was the daughter, I mean the son of Bathsheba and of David and how we see the judgment on David's life and, and her on the adultery and how that child was taken. And of course the Bible teaches us as we looked last week that he came in to comfort her and they had a child together and it's Solomon right there and there were others that could have been king but Solomon was set apart by God and of course David met with him to tell him hey you're going to be the continuation of the covenant that God made with me and you're the next king and and do that which is right so here's Solomon wisest man going hey I gave my heart I put my heart to something important to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven but there's more to the story as you were laughing the other day, what was his name, Paul Harvey? The rest of the story, there is two different Solomons, maybe many more Solomons, but there's two different ones. The one that wrote the book of Proverbs and Song of Solomon, the one that wrote Ecclesiastes, because he says in the second half of this verse, almost like, hey God, why did you give this assignment to us? This sore travail, this, this trial, this... this, this passion or suffering that God has given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. It's almost like, God, you gave this to man, and it's, it really is a good thing, but it also, he's showing the bad side of things. Because again, it goes back to the theme verse that we're uh, reading here today, and the title of our series, Search for Purpose in Everything. Do you search things out? Do you look at things in a way that God would have you to look at them? Do you search the scriptures daily? Do you find in yourself the, the default of saying, yeah, I learned that before, or I can ask somebody else, or I wasn't at the message today, could you please send me the notes, or there was a Bible Institute course and I was able to go a couple of times, but uh, and I tried to t study and search things out, but then I gave up because it was too hard. So I looked online, I tried to find something else, or I, I read a book, or I did some of those things. And do you get to that place in your life where you just really don't search out things? Last week's message after the introduction was a few minutes of just a short devotion proper exercise? Do you exercise in the scriptures properly? Do you exercise your faith properly? Or have you got to a point again where you say, yeah, whatever I know, I know. It's too much hard work to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Could I just download something? 
Can I just, just, just hook in and just, just... But the deal is here with Solomon, he had an incredible download from God. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. He's the one who wrote most of the Proverbs. And he wrote them in a way that shows this closeness with God. And now we see by the Spirit of God, the writing here in the Word of God, that we see his distance from God. Maybe that's you this morning thinking, yeah, I could have written Proverbs, and now maybe I'm the person that's reading Ecclesi- writing Ecclesiastes. Maybe I'm in a place in your life. Hey, just be transparent with God. Be transparent with those closest to you. And say, hey, I've been living a life of vanity. It's all futility in my life. It's like I just took a breath or a vapor and, and there's emptiness in my life. And, and life has just become to a point where it's just, eh, I don't know why I'm here. I used to know why I'm here. Well, I know why I'm here, but I don't know the purpose in my life every day. In fact, you know what? I see an awful lot of things wrong in this world. I wish that everybody would just set, set aside and just put me in charge so I could point out all their problems. You know, I see that, you know, this room right here, I wish they'd start painting it. For crying out loud, as long as they can take it, I mean, they got dust, they got cobwebs, I don't know if the air conditioning is too cold, too hot, I don't know. I, I mean, I can just see so many problems here. Or, I see opportunities. See, you're in here today to gather for the opportunity to hear from God. You're not looking for something that's wrong. You're not looking for something that's missing You're not looking for the absence of things. You want to say, God, yeah, there's problems around, but I want to know the old phrase, the opportunity. So that's why we're calling our message today, problems, problem, or opportunity. I was going to plural it, but I figured you guys could plural it on your own. I just figured there's only one problem in the whole world, and that's me. So you're all set. But I, I think myself as being an opportunity, too. I don't know. Just don't ask my wife that. We just celebrated a few years of marriage. And last week, I think I was an opportunity. This week, I'm back to being a problem. It kind of goes back and forth like that. I have to remind her, you know, we had a nice dinner that night. It was good. Yeah. But here we are back to... See, that's the encapsulation here today. That's Solomon. Solomon started waking up every day in this kind of condition. And any one of you, any one of us can end up being in that place where you were writing Proverbs of the Lord. You were journaling. You were spending time with God. You were writing prayers down. You were going through things and saying, God, I want to be closer to you. My my greatest desire is to know you and the power of your resurrection like Paul the Apostle. All I want to do is commune with you. I want to be near you. That's all I want. Or is it, that was a futile search The wisdom that I gained from God didn't help me solve all the problems in my life. I've been praying to God to see people get saved. I've been praying and begging God to change things in my life. I've been begging God to solve problems. And all I see is problems everywhere. Opportunities. What, are you crazy? Well, you can line up with what Solomon is saying here today. You and I can line up with that. Because we start thinking that way. Solomon forgot that God did visit with him twice. Solomon forgot that he was charged by David to be the anointed one. Solomon saw problems and so many things, yet he was the one who saw the glory of God in building the temple and praying and preaching and gathering the people as the preacher teacher in a different time to gather them over the building of the temple. You see, Solomon was stuck like so many believers are stuck today. How do you know? been around a little bit. I haven't seen everything like Solomon says, but I've heard the brokenheartedness of so many people. But I've also seen the incredible opportunities of God working in people's lives, of God putting marriages and families together, of seeing God heal relationships, of teaching people how to learn to forgive 
to be sorrowful, to be genuinely repentant. You see, to me, Solomon never got a handle on his father's model. Search me, O God, and know my heart. He never got a handle on that. He never got a handle, I don't believe, in creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore the joy of my salvation. Maybe that was a problem for him. Maybe David was just too much for him. I don't know. But I will say this today as we get into the first chapter. We're going to cover all 18 verses. We're going to read through and break them down into two different sections and highlight some things. And then we'll see what God has for us for lessons at the end. Problem, opportunity. John Adams said, every problem is an opportunity in disguise. Sun Xu said, victory comes from finding opportunities in problems. Winston Churchill, he said in quotes, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. Each one of us can step back and say, yeah, I got that. You see, burdens and struggles in life, they can result in one of two things. And many things, but in general, losing faith in God, just saying no more, or growing stronger in God. Because the things come. Struggles come, burdens come. You understand Jesus Christ and his teaching. You see, in the revelational beauty of the word of God, how he shows you exactly what he was doing, how he was doing things. And you say, God, I I would love an explanation, but I don't get one. I'm just going to lean on your promises. And I'm going to stand on the promises of God. I'm going to stay right there. The preacher, teacher Solomon, was calling out the nation. He called them all together, the assembly, to tell them all about how awful burdens and struggles are and how he was losing faith. And again, be reminded in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's no message from God. There's no message from God. Yet he is the king. God's anointed. You are anointed by God and the Holy Spirit in the moment of your salvation. You are of the royal priesthood, a people set apart. Do you know your standing before God is even more so in the new covenant through Jesus Christ? And yet, sometimes we see the problems that mount against us as an impediment to growing closer, just like Solomon wrote. What are some life issues that you once saw as opportunities for God to work that you now just regard as unsolvable problems. What happened? What happened? What happened? Well, the same thing happened to you that's happened to all of us at different seasons of our lives. We backpedaled. We stopped searching for purpose in everything. We listened to someone give us comments, suggestions, thoughts. We stopped reading the scriptures. We stopped studying the word of God. We stopped listening to the preaching of the word of God. We decided we don't have to open the Bible anymore. We decided that prayer, well, God can't hear me anyway. I mean, I've been praying and God will not remove this from me. Well, maybe you could relate to Paul then who said, the thorn, he sought the Lord thrice. And he left it right there. Paul wrestled with so many things, just like you wrestle with so many things, like Solomon wrestled. We are all in the same playing field here. And Solomon makes it clear. Again, when you see search for purpose and everything, it should stop you for a moment and go, okay, am I going to search the scriptures? Am I going to search things out? Am I going to look into things? Am I going to wonder? Hey, parents in here, do you know what your children are being taught this morning in Sunday school? You ought to go find out. Why wouldn't you? Oh, I'm just trusting they're doing a good job. They might be in there not even using the Bible. How would you like that? That's not true, by the way. I'd have to fire Pam. No, actually, she'd fire me. The leadership of the people that are in this ministry deliver the word of God on a regular basis. You can trust that, but why don't you go search it out? They got discipleship hour at 9 o'clock. What in the world are you teaching, Brian? You got to go search it. You got to go check it out. You have a small group once a month over at Marty's house. I heard all you do is eat food. No, you study the Bible. You got a Wednesday night Bible study, Deuteronomy. What are they teaching? I have no idea. Go search out and find out. Got to 
Bible Institute course tonight. Oh, I don't know what it's about. Go to the class and find out. Search for purpose in everything. Parents, grandparents, let's all wake up a little bit and start searching out what's going on to our children. Solomon abandoned his incredible responsibility, and this is how he ends his life. Well, he wrote some good stuff in Proverbs. The old phrase in business goes, one bad customer can ruin five years of great business. Right, Justin? One bad word, one bad job can destroy. This man's words in Ecclesiastes, they make everyone consider what happened to the wisest man on the face of the earth. What happened to his testimony? What happened to this man who showed in the Song of Solomon what it means to have a great love and relationship with God? How could you write those words and write, because... He is frail just like you and me. And without Jesus Christ being the centerpiece of your life day by day by day, you can day by day by day be in a place of erosion and you see problems and you don't see opportunities. Very simply, 18 verses, two sections, verses 1 through 11 are first. We're going to read those, make a few teaching points there, and then we're going to take a look at verses 12 through 18. Okay? Teaching points there. And then two little tiny lessons at the end that bring this all together practically for you and me. Join me. Chapter number one, verse number one. Here he is, Ecclesiastes, or the preacher. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Boy, whew, he's got some issues already. Here we go. Verse number three, because we see vanity, we see profit, we see under the sun, we see under heaven. We see these terms quite a bit. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also riseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. You don't have to take any more science classes. You're all set. Now you know how it works. You know how the earth abides forever. The sun rises and goes down. The wind blows around. Oh, wait a minute. Let's get to the water. Verse number 7. The rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What a profound proverb right there. Verse number 9 through 11, here he goes. You know the old phrase, there's nothing new under the sun, there's nothing that's going to come that you've never seen. Here he goes, verse number 9, 10, and 11. A lot of wisdom here in the midst of his distance from God. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Verse 10, is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. When things play out after a while, you go, yeah, I got that. You see, in the simplicity of what he's saying, there's also a more profound statement. He really is saying life is really monotonous. Life is boring. That's how I would encapsulate the first 11 verses. Most places, when you study and look it up, they say something in that familiarity. Like, what in the world are we here for? What is life? It's even a vapor. I mean, we looked at that verse last week. People, do you really love life? The Bible teaches about loving the life that you've been given, especially the life in Jesus Christ that you've been given. But he's saying life is monotonous. Hey, I'll give you one simple one here, caught in the context. Very simple. Just want to give you some thoughts in our teaching time. He says there, verse number four, a generation passeth away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. How many of you were born at one time? Don't raise your hands. How many of you haven't died yet? 
You're pretty smart. This is a smart group. The 9 o'clock group, they went a little slow today. I, I, I don't want to compare them. You know, it's a group. I don't want to say that. Now consider. I pass away in my sleep last night. You're still here today. The earth's still here. One generation comes, another generation goes, another generation goes, another generation comes, and it continues to come until this beautiful earth that God made is stopped by him. It still will be here while every generation plays itself out. If you're wondering about end, end times, there's a Bible Institute course that's in the fifth week now looking at eschatology. You see, Solomon is really teaching some good stuff. But have you considered all the earthly stuff and all that it is? If that's all it is, it is vanity. It is all futility. It's emptiness. It is vapor. It is nothing. You know what? Things disappear. Things come. Things go. Under the sun, they're going to be here, and then they're going to be gone. It says in verse number 13, I mean, verse number three, what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? When you leave this earth, that labor meant nothing. Zero. But those are the things that you did for Christ. They last forever. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Don't forget what Solomon said in the very last verse of the text in Ecclesiastes about judgment. That every work will come into a judgment. Lost, you're going to be judged. Saved, you're going to be judged. Judgment is coming for every one of us. It's going to perpetually keep on coming. But that's the spirit stuff that's very, very important on this earth. He's saying life is monotonous. And there's some truth to that apart from Jesus Christ. But in Jesus Christ, it's full, it's meaningful, it's abundant, it's purposeful, it's everything. And when you tell people, hey, I can relate to you because I'm born again, I know Jesus Christ is Savior, but there are times in my life where I thought that life was monotonous just like you. How hard is it to witness to people like that? Have a conversation with people. How many people intersected your life today? Yesterday, the week before, the week before. How many people came into your life that were not through church, or through work, or through your family. People that were put into your life, orchestrated by God, that are looking at life and going, it's purposeless, it's meaningless. Hey, we're going through a study in our church on Sunday mornings in Ecclesiastes, and there's this guy, Solomon, who used to be the, one of the, the wisest man on the face of the earth, and he said the same thing. I can relate. You're immediately in a conversation. God orchestrates people, intentionally putting people in your life. And what are you going to tell them? Well, there's no profit in living here. There isn't. But what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus taught everything that you're seeing here. Jesus cleared it up. It's all cleared up in the word of God. The point is that you and I just don't search for purpose in everything. You're to la labor and you toil. <laughs> you know what? He mentions man so many times in this few chapters. He mentions the the frailty of man. He shows, of course, the wisdom and how much wisdom means to him, but yet he looks at things and goes, yeah, God, I'll mention you. You're Elohim, you're God, I got that. But he never uses the terminology of Jehovah in his interactive, the Lord. You gotta wonder about Solomon at this point in his life. Life is monotonous to him. It's tiresome. It's wearisome. And when you look at verses 9 and 10, you say, wow, wow, what happened there? Well, you know what he's saying? I don't see any opportunity in life. Basically, in verses 9 and 10, it's like what it says up on the screen. Problem, opportunity. Here he's stating in verse number 9 and 10, it's a problem. Why? You can see it clearly. The thing that has been, has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. Why bother? Why bother? Why bother is what he's saying. What I say is, why not bother? There's a cycle of life and death, yes. But when you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, you're now alive. You're spiritually alive. Remember this. There's a lot of things that do not ever change. 
when it's tied together to nature and rules of life and laws. But God is changing you every single day if you desire so. If he is put in a place where you beg him and ask him, please create in me a clean heart. You ask him and say, make me more like Jesus Christ. Yeah, the sun's going to be there. The moon's going to be there. The earth is going to be there. The sea is going to be there. They're going to do their thing. They're going to do their thing. And I'm thankful that you put me here, God. But in verse number 10, as he says, is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. Are you going to get to the place where you're cantankerous like me and just tell everybody, get off my lawn? Well, I've already seen that. I've already heard that. I just don't bother me. You see, now you're leaving out the element of what God does in his greatest working is through relationships. Because we don't have an interest in people because we've seen or done everything. He says in verses number 12 down through 18 a few more things. He's pointing to something else here. Continue with me in verse number 12. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. We pointed something out last week. Be reminded of the phraseology of I gave my heart. Because you'll see it again in verse number 16, my heart. Verse number 17, I gave my heart. So follow along with this man and what he's saying by the Holy Spirit. Again, this verse says in the second half, this sore travail had God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. Verse 14, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. And that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Just really quick, think for a minute in that perspective. What a proverb. The things that people want, the people wanting, it cannot be numbered. Think of the hundred people in this room right now. Any of you want anything? I wanted it not to rain today so that we could do our bed build. I didn't get my way. How do you do when you don't get your way? I usually throw a fit. (laughs) That's what I do. I want something. You see, you cannot measure the wanting of things. Solomon's telling you something very, very important there. That's the breaking down of things. He says, I've seen all the work. I've seen everything. Things that are crooked can't be made straight. Things that, uh, which is wanting cannot be numbered. You, you, can't, you can't number the wants. It's like when you go to the kids for Christmas. Just, I, just, you can just say, one, one, what do you want for Christmas? Don't ask your children that. How about for lunch? What do you want for lunch? What? Did your mother ever ask you for what you wanted for lunch? No! What would you like for lunch? Today, here's your menu. You can have a PP&J, you can have a macaroni and cheese. Would you like grilled cheese? Would you like cheddar, or would you like American today, son? What would you like? What? It's the wanting part. By the way, you can't make... (laughs) Anyway, moving on. Verse 16 and 17, again, are powerful. What a phrase. What a great phrase. I communed with my own heart, saying, Oh, lo, I am come to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, I love God so much. Not. He says, My heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And, verse 17, I gave my heart to know wisdom, comma, and to know madness and folly, I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Apart from God and his purpose and everything, wisdom is just futile. He's saying it and saying it to you before me, before you, before God, in the scriptures, wisdom, ah, Ah, it's wonderful to have, but you know what? I went after folly too. I wanted to know madness, and he did. And what good did it do him? What good does it do us, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, to go after folly, madness, 
well, I've got the wisdom of God. Yeah, you're saying the same thing Solomon did. you got the wisdom of God. Why don't I go after something more other than God? Oh, we're funny that way. Well, since I've got that in my back pocket, I can get some more. And I end up getting more and more wisdom because God said it's the principal thing. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I think we've forgotten completely about what it means to fear God. And I think Solomon forgot too because Solomon is the one who wrote that stuff in the book of Proverbs. It goes all the way back to what I said earlier. This study is for every one of us to understand that Solomon... Oh my gosh, wisdom, a thousand times more than you could ever have. But then we think, well, what do we have? We have the mind of Christ. The word of God before you. You've got the mind of Christ. He never said that. It never is attributed to him that he had the mind of Christ, but it's attributed to the believers of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 that you had the mind of Christ. What do I do with that? Oh, I've got that. Let me put it in here, and I'm going to go after madness and folly. You see, that's what our scriptures are telling us. Futility is just trifle, trifling stuff. You're just trifling with things. It's putting yourself in a place where you're producing no valuable effect. He's saying wisdom has no valuable effect. That's his conclusion at the end of his life when it's not true because wisdom is the principal thing from God. You say you get too much wisdom. He says, when I got older and I got so much wisdom... It messed me up, he said. Increased knowledge, increased sorrow. Maybe that's so true in so many of the things that you end up knowing as a pastor or as a grandpa or grandma. You've been around life for a long time and you've seen so much stuff and you said, I know how this is going to go. I don't even want to be near it. I know what's going to happen. Oh, please, God, I can't take anymore. And in that moment, you're to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're supposed to say, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, that passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. How would you ever know peace unless you were at war? How would you ever know failure unless you had success? And how would you know what success is unless you had failure? How would you know what it's like to be at peace and calm, to have victory? Unless you'd had losses. And some of you that have suffered loss, you know what I'm talking about. How could you ever know what it means to have victory in Jesus if you never suffered any loss? You see, Solomon lost so much. And yet he was still in a place where he said wisdom is futile. And I believe that many of my brothers and sisters need to have a tiny little bit of revival in their lives. And realize that life is not monotonous. Believers, you've got Jesus. Wisdom is not futile. It is powerful. Especially when you look at how God says wisdom from him makes all the difference. It causes you to have discretion, discernment. If you wonder, just read the first three Proverbs. And you get to a point where you go, oh God, Problem or opportunity, problem or opportunity, problem or opportunity. I think we forget that we live by God's promises, not by his explanations. I read that. I just thought I'd pass it on. I didn't come up with it. But sometimes we just look at things and go, well, you didn't fulfill my expectations. You didn't fulfill my expectations. You didn't fulfill my expectations. I am totally frustrated with you. I'm totally frustrated with you. And who am I talking to? God. You get frustrated with God. And God says, I've got promises for you. Promise after promise after promise after promise. And when you're going through that awful angerful time, I will assuage your anger and I will give you great joy. When you're going through a disconnection and you're having a conflict and a confrontation has to come in a healthy way, you say, I'll be with you. Go bless somebody. Go forgive someone. Go be sorrowful. Go be repentant. And remember, truly and completely, that he and his word, God put every one of these words in here for a purpose. It's not for you and me to go, ah, this is just crazy. How in the world could I relate to Solomon? How about you just relate to the word of God? Period. Because it's the word of God. And it's written for you and for me. And if you think, okay, Solomon says something that's crooked can't be made straight. 
Okay. Well, all that stuff that's going on in the world is nothing new under the sun. Okay. You need to get to a place where you say, I'm going to search out, I'm going to search out things. Because God has so much for us, church, so much for our church. So here's two simple little things to tack on here in the last few minutes to allow you not to, they're not just extras, they're culmination of making some practical application after looking at the background of the text. What is Solomon doing here? He's letting us know that he gave his heart to know things, to seek things, and yet he did it apart from the Lord. He did it apart from his relationship with God, and that truly just rings a bell in my life. It rings a bell in my spirit. It rings a bell here when he says, I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this is also vexation of spirit. If you and I get to a place where we say those things, it's time to go. Get before God on our knees and say, restore to me, God, the joy of my salvation. Put me back in a place where I know that each and every day is filled with purpose in you. I have to fight through this incredible fleshly desire to not to seek and to search out things and to just live off of what I learned from someone else instead of the Holy Spirit of God in my time in the Word. And every pastor, every preacher, every teacher, every head of a home, mom or dad, who's had to teach the Bible to their children or minister, any children's ministry worker, any person that's ever ministered the Word of God, has seen an incredible obstacle and a problem there in front of you, how you're going to do it, what you're going to do. But then you say, wow, God, thank you for the opportunity. And there's a young man that says that to me awful, an awful lot, and I appreciate that. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, in the midst of some problems, there's a lot of things to be found, but I just narrowed it down to a couple things for us today. The first one is this. The problem amidst the wisdom of this world, the world's wisdom, is that it opens up the opportunity on the other side to search the scriptures for the wisdom of God. I don't mind when you call me or you call Brian or Bobby for an answer with things. That's fine. I'm going to have you start calling Tony Pittman. Tony will tell you whatever you need to know. Call Tony. Tony, pass out your phone number. There you go. Alexis, they can call you, right? There you go. And you'll say search the scriptures. Because here's where it's at. You and I get caught in a problem of trying to find an answer to something from the wisdom of the world instead of from the scriptures. The scriptures will never let you down. They'll tell you the truth every time. They'll do it with grace. They'll do it with strong challenge and exhortation. And God's saying, I'm going to edify you and build you up and I'm going to teach you. That's what we need to know. I put up on the screen a couple of addresses. Go with me to Colossians 1 real quick. I'll highlight this verse. You can study it out a little bit later. And then we'll look at James chapter number 3. Colossians 1 will not be up on the screen, but we'll have James 3 up there. Colossians 1 verse 9, it says something from Paul to the church as he's getting this church to get back centered on the preeminent one, the head of the body, Jesus Christ. And he's saying in verse 9, For this cause... We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. What is he praying? He has a prayer for you and a desire for you, church, that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? Because of verse number 10, that you would walk every day, practically speaking, that you would look at this problem amidst the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world is really messed up. But it's also twisting. We'll get to James 3 here in a minute. It could twist you up a little bit and make it sound like it's true and it's good. But he's saying, I pray for you and I desire for you that you have all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
Verse number 11, strengthened with all might and according to his glorious power with all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us to meet, made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The whole package there reminds you and me of one thing, very simply. The wisdom that you want comes from your word, from the word of God, from the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the light that you're going to get that pulls you out of the darkness of this kingdom world that you live in. But we get caught up. We get stuck in listening to this one, listening to that one, listening to this one. And the problem with the wisdom of the world is that it drags you and I down and makes us see problems in everything. And the reality is there is problems. Well, what about the opportunity to search the scripture for the word, wisdom of God? What would God have me do? What does God want me to do? Well, that means you just need to read your Bible more and more and more and more and more. And keep on reading it. Where do I read? Start at the front and work your way all the way back and then start again. Can God answer questions about the exact situation that I'm going through when I'm reading Ecclesiastes? Absolutely. Can I read through the Gospel of John? Absolutely. Can I read through Leviticus and he can teach me something while I'm going through something I need an answer from? Yes, he can. Every single time the wisdom of God from his word is on the money. And if you haven't heard it today, go back tomorrow and look again. And go back the next day. And go back the next day. And search for purpose in everything. And you will be, ha- be finding it because God will show it to you. James chapter number 3. It's up on, the, up on the screen here. Follow along. Because this is a powerful statement about the wisdom of this world versus the wisdom of God. It says in verse number 13 in James chapter number 3, Who is a wise man? And who is endued with knowledge among you? Who is the smarty pants in the room? Let him show out of a good conversation, his works with meekness and of, wi- of wisdom. Like, if a person's wise and he says he's wise, then watch him to see who, they're, who they are and what they're all about. But, verse number 14, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. It's all predicated on your senses. It's not predicated on the word of God and its truth. Sensual is very simple. I heard it. I feel it, I saw it, I smelt it, I tasted it. That gives me concrete proof. That's the wisdom of this world. God's word and wisdom will clear up your senses. It will allow you to have the gates cleaned right out and you'll know what he's saying because it can be devilish, the wisdom that comes not from above. But verse number 16 from, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of peace and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. That's a load right there. That is powerful wisdom. That is just giving it time. Stay with it. Read and study. Read and study. Continue to stay with it for about 10, 15, 20 years. He will increase your wisdom, and it will not be to increase your sorrow. You may have a heart of God that sorrows over people that you know that are lost, but you will not be sorrowful that God gave you wisdom above your measure. Verse 18, and the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Oh, oh, I like that. I like that. You see, it's written in the New Testament how important wisdom is. Oh, my goodness. Not just in this study back there. Oh, yeah. You see, we're, we're presenting the, the aspect of what Solomon is writing to us historically and doctrinally. And then we come up here and we say, oh, practical application in my life. This is an inspirational part to go, okay, this wisdom that comes from above is different wisdom. It's beautiful wisdom. Oh, it definitely is identifiable by the believer. Just don't be fooled to think that the wisdom of this world really has God's thought process in mind. It gets God's stuff, twists it just a little, and just as you see, it's devilish. It's earthly, and it's sensual. And what does it cause? 
envying and strife. And there is confusion. Bam. Bible teaches us something today. In five minutes you learned something from God's word that fills your wisdom tank. There you go. Second one, and we're done. The problem amidst a life of vanity. Now we looked at the wisdom of the world and its problem, but it had an opportunity. The life of vanity, it opens up the opportunity for Jesus Christ to fill the emptiness in the heart. Now think about that. If you do not have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ today, it's empty. Your soul is bound for an eternity in hell. The Bible teaches that. But the Bible says also, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Your sin. You will be redeemed because the blood of Christ will cleanse your sin away. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no taking away. You're also going to be in a place where you get eternal life through Jesus Christ. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Woo! Then the emptiness that's in your heart and soul will be filled. Then you can say, I get it. It's not by works that I can be saved. It's for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You need to call upon the name of the Lord to save you. Believe in what his finished work has done in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And call on his name to fill that emptiness. Believers, sometimes you live like you are empty. Sometimes we live that way. Up on the screen, you've got a couple of addresses to write on your notes. I think we have time for one. So let's go to Ephesians chapter number 4 while you write those other down, others down. You can look at Romans 8. You'll recognize that. I covered that in our victorious series. And it talks about the vanity that we are born with in our flesh before we're born again. Paul says it in Romans chapter number 8. But of course he's instructing the church in Ephesians 4 about what they need to do to deal with the vanity that's in their mind. So we close out with this. Think now, there's a problem in the wisdom of this world and there's a problem in the vanity of life. You know, Solomon put it right before us. If you had no other book in the Word of God, you go, oh my gosh, this is just a waste of time. But you got all 66 and God's putting this Bible, this, this uh, book in the Bible for a reason. And we're finding that out as we go. And in Ephesians 4, Paul's telling this beautiful church that was founded on the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love for one another. They really had this, they, were, they loved God. Yeah. And they knew of God's love, yet the Bible says they left their first love. In Ephesians 4, verse number 17, watch how this comes together for us. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, because Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. He's talking to the church, the believers. He continues in verse number 18, describing what it's like as a Gentile to walk in the vanity of your mind. Maybe this has been you in a season of your life, or maybe this is you right now, and you need to get out of this place where you're walking as a born-again believer in the carnality of your mind, and you're walking in the vanity of your mind. He says in verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. These Gentiles are lost. They have blindness in their heart. They don't understand what you know. But he's saying to the church at Ephesus, the believers in Ephesus, hey, stop, watch out, because you may be walking some of you like the other Gentiles in the vanity of your mind. He says that they also, in verse number 19, who be in past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness. To work all uncleanness with greediness. What a great warning for us. Solomon's got a whole book to warn us. that I don't want to fall into that mess. Verse number 20. One of my favorite short verses in the Bible. Right next to Jesus wept. Here you go. But ye have not so learned Christ. 
that gets my attention. You don't have it together like you think you do, Mr. Brown. You better check out your walk. I mean, you look up in that big 16 by 9 screen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You didn't know I could count, did you? You guys didn't know that. Seven simple words, you go, whoa. So here's the life is vanity situation that we all can fall into. Because this is for the church, the vanity of our minds. Verse 21 down through 24, and we'll be done. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, that vanity of your mind. Verse 23, and be renewed in the mind of, excuse me, in the spirit of your mind. You've been renewed by Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 24, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, he goes through a long list of the wherefores. Here it is. When you say, wait a minute. The problem amidst the life of vanity, that has to be for all the lost people. He's writing it to the church. Ah, we're better than that. (laughs) That's the vanity of your mind. That's the pride that we get in the midst of. He's saying, this moment of confrontation by the Holy Spirit, by his word right there, tells me I have an opportunity for Jesus Christ to fill the emptiness that's in my heart. You say, you mean you lost your salvation? I did not say that. Just ask yourself this simple question. When's the last time that you commune, not just with yourself, but with God, and say, God, I don't know. Do I love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength? And he'll answer you. And do I love my neighbor as myself? Because he says everything rests on those two in fulfillment of all the law. And Jesus says, I fulfilled all the law. I'll go even one step further, disciples. Greater love hath no man than this. Lay down his life for his friends. By this shall all men know you, my disciples. Now you have that conversation with God and see where you're at. What are you going to search about this week? What are you going to search out? Maybe that's just your search this week. Do you see problems in everything? Or do you see the opportunity? What will be our search, church, together for purpose in everything this week? Problem? Opportunity. The beautiful part about it is when God shows you the problem, he says, here is my son. Here's my scripture. Here's my grace. Here's my forgiveness. Here's my love. I want you to be close to me because I sent my son for you. Would you please bow your head for a word of prayer as we close out our service? I thank you, Father, for your word. It continues to be my source and my brothers and sisters' source, our church. We have the source It's the living word of God. Thank you, Jesus, for being all that we need in every moment and every spot. Wisdom is not futile. Life is not monotonous in you, you, Jesus. It's beautiful. It's got its trials. It's got its heartaches. But it's got so much in your grace and goodness, and I thank you. I pray for our church family this morning as we finish up that this invitation time would bring them to a place of deciding what are they going to search this week. What are we going to search for purpose in? Is it the people? Is it our personal relationship? Is it the way I study and the way I go about business with you and with others? What is it, God? Please, I pray, bring clarity to this moment for everybody. In Jesus' name, amen.